The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello and welcome to the first episode of The Week in Art in 2021. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the banality of evil. We look at white supremacy in the capital, in Washington, and the legacy of Hannah Arendt. As well as exploring Confederate statues in the US Capitol and a new series of exhibitions in London inspired by the writings of the political theorist Hannah Arendt, a bit later on we look at a record-breaking auction sale of a Batman comic. Before all that, the art newspaper has a January sale. Save 30% when you purchase a digital subscription before the end of January. The subscription includes full access to our website and iOS app for iPhone and iPad. The promo code is WAX121. That's W-A-X-121. Now, on the 6th of January, we saw terrifying scenes in Washington, D.C. as right-wing rioters and conspiracy theorists incited by the President, Donald Trump, and other Republican politicians invaded the Capitol building. One of the emblematic images of that day, taken by Mike Tyler for Reuters, featured one of the rioters walking across the second floor of the Capitol holding a Confederate flag. With chilling irony, behind him on the wall is a portrait of Charles Sumner, a 19th century Massachusetts senator who was an abolitionist. But it didn't need the rioters to bring white supremacist imagery into the capital. Eight statues of Confederate leaders still stand in the building. So we're going to begin this episode with a special version of our regular feature, Work of the Week, and focus on Confederate statues and the capital. Sarah Beetham is the Chair of Liberal Arts and Assistant Professor of Art History at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. She's chosen to focus on a sculpture that was in the capital until recently but is no longer there, Edward Valentine's 1909 statue of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee, which was removed from the capital's National Statuary Hall on the 21st of December 2020, so just over two weeks before the riot. Sarah, the images from the Capitol last week of Confederate imagery inside the Capitol were obviously deeply disturbing. But but that building actually has white supremacist imagery in it already, doesn't it? Yes, it absolutely does. Um, You know, as I was watching all of those images going by on my um, on my phone and on my on my computer screen, um, you know, at first I was just so upset as an American um, to be watching and worrying about, um, you know, our members of Congress, their staff in that building, um, seeing that symbolic space be breached. Um, I was thinking so much about the officers who put themselves on the line to try to take care of and and um, protect our members of Congress. My heart really goes out to all the officers who were injured and the two who lost their lives. Um, but of course, I was also thinking about. Um, the Capitol and those spaces as an art historian um, and as a scholar of American art. Um, And one of the things that I kept coming back to over and over again was thinking about the significance of all of the art in that collection. Um, You have uh, in the Capitol, you have um, in the rotunda, you have those enormous paintings of um, all of these scenes from from American history. Um, You have the uh, rotunda with the um, freeze going around it that is showing all these different scenes of American history as well. Um, But then one of the major parts that I've been thinking about for a long time is the National Statuary Hall collection, um, which is a collection of 100 statues, um, two of which come from each state, um, that uh, began in 1864, um, and each state has had the ability over time to donate their own two statues to it. Um, and um, there are a couple of different criteria for getting into the statuary hall. Um, the statues have to be either marble or bronze, so kind of the highest level um, of, of preserved statuary. Um, the subject must be deceased, must have been associated with that state, um, and must be historically noteworthy in some way. Um, and subjects are decided on by the states and then donated to the capital collection with very little oversight by the, by the capital collection. Um, and what I think that maybe maybe more people know now, but I didn't know until a few years ago, was that a number of the statues in the Capitol Statuary Hall collection are actually Confederates, um, either Confederate generals, um, the Confederate president, uh, Jefferson Davis was there, um, the Confederate vice president, Alexander Stevens. Um, 
But the one that, as I was watching those images over and over and over again that kept coming into my head, was the statue of Robert E. Lee, um, which was donated by the state of Virginia in 1909. Um, it was by um, Edward Valentine, who was a well-known Confederate sympathizing sculptor. Um, and it actually wasn't there to be present for the riots because it had just been removed in December, on December 21st of 2020. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people talked about those images of people going by with Confederate flags, but I kept thinking, you know, this kind of imagery has been there, um, has been supporting um, the, the Capitol for a very long time. Can we talk about, a bit about Valentine before we go on to the specific sculpture that we're talking about? Because it's, it seems to me to be really amazing that there is this sculptor who, long after the deaths of these people... Mm -hmm was effectively making statues repeatedly of confederate generals can you explain that history so what you know why was valentine in his own time creating these statues sure so valentine was a southerner um his um entire family was established um in richmond virginia um there's a museum there today the valentine museum that includes collections related to the whole family he came from a very wealthy family he wasn't actually a confederate soldier because he was studying overseas um, to become an artist while the war was over but when he came back um, he saw a real opportunity to get involved in confederate commemoration um, and uh, he actually produced a number of major statues um, that have been in the news in the past couple of, of months um, one of them is the gisant of robert e lee um, lying dead in state um, that is at Washington and Lee University um, in the chapel that's kind of above where his tomb is. Um, it's a very striking sculpture for anybody who hasn't seen it before. I recommend looking it up. Yeah, look it up online, everyone. It's it's bizarre, frankly. Yeah, yeah it's bizarre. It's weirdly beautiful, um, but, you know, very strange to stand in front of because it's just the marble is so white. <laughs> Um, yeah. so yeah, and that's, and that's symbolic itself. Um, so he's, he created that sculpture. He created two different statues of Jefferson Davis, both of which are no longer standing. Um, one of which was one of the four statues that was removed in New Orleans in 2017, which kind of kicked off this big wave of iconoclasm that we've seen over the past, past couple of years. Um, and then the other one was toppled from Monument Avenue in Richmond so this past June, um, kind of flat on its face and then covered with graffiti um so and he was also um he did not actually get the commission for the robert e lee statue in richmond but he was one of the finalists for that commission as well um the big the big statue in richmond that hasn't come down yet um so uh you know he was somebody who certainly sympathized with the south and and you know through his had in with the state of Virginia, um, and so has been kind of right at the center of, of so many of these conversations over the past couple of months and the past couple of years. So th this statue of Robert E. Lee, it's not one of those rather cheap mass produced things that was that appeared right the way through the sort of Jim Crow era that, that many of these debates about Confederate statues have been about, right? It's a, it, it, it's a high quality bronze, it's a unique object. Yes, absolutely. Um, and all of the objects in the Statuary Hall collection are um, more of the high quality that you're talking about. So they are all either marble or bronze. Um, and for the most part, I mean, you know, sculpture is something that can be replicated. Um, and so sometimes there are two or three versions of some of these, um, but they would have been works that are created specifically for the Statuary Hall collection. Um, now, you know, there have been um, criticisms of that collection. I think over time, it's when you actually walk through the Capitol, it's, it's kind of strange. Um, none of the, the statues were really obviously intended to be together. They're on pedestals that are all different heights. Some of them are marble, some of them are in bronze. They're in slightly different styles, um, different clothing. And so it's kind of a weird hodgepodge um, to a certain extent. But there's also something kind of charming about that as well. Um, that um, there's, you know, in the, in the kind of heterogeneity of it, um, it kind of reflects the fact that these things are coming from a bunch of different, very different states. And, and, and to what level of awareness is, is there among politicians in Congress that there are these statues, deeply problematic statues, in the bowels of the building, as it were? Um, I think that maybe a few years ago, maybe people wouldn't have talked about it as much. Um, but um, sort of in the last three years, uh, there have been several moves by different Democratic legislators um, to attempt to get the Confederates out 
of, of the building. Um, my own Senator, Cory Booker, um, was one of the ones who I think back in 2017 was trying to get a bill passed to get them out. Of course, you know, our Congress has been so divided for so long that um, the ability to make a bipartisan move on anything has been pretty much impossible. Um, and so it's really been kind of up to the states to decide themselves whether or not they're going to swap these um, these statues out. So what happened in Virginia was that um, within the past couple of years, the Virginia legislature, the, the assembly um, and the Senate have become completely democratic and Virginia now has a democratic governor. And now that those things are the case, um, Virginia is making decisions to um, change up some of their Confederate imagery, get the statues down from Mon Monument Avenue, for instance, and then get Robert E. Lee out of the Capitol. So it's now out of the Capitol. It is now out. Where's it going? Um, I believe it is the Mus Virginia Museum of History and Culture took it. Um, I think I should note too, I, uh, one other thing I forgot to say is where it was, um, which is also incredibly significant. Um, so the area that's in the Capitol that where all the paintings are that we've seen all the pictures of over the, the past couple of days, that area is the Capitol Rotunda. Directly underneath that space, which of course um, has the big dome on top of it. Um, massive when you're thinking about architecture and thinking about masonry, um, that you know that there's going to have to be a support space to be able to hold that space up. What's directly underneath is a space called the crypt, which has 40 enormous Doric columns and huge arches that are all supporting that space up above that. In the center of that space, there is a compass that represents where all of those diagonal streets in Washington, D.C., all of them come together on that compass. Originally, there was a plan to bury George Washington under that space, but eventually his family decided to keep him at Mount, Mount Vernon. And in that space, um, surrounding that were 13 statues um, that were uh, all representing the 13 original states of the United States. One of them, of course, is the state of Virginia, and that was Robert E. Lee. Right. So Robert E. Lee not only was in the Capitol, um, this man who was so responsible for costing so many American lives, but he was there representing Virginia among the 13 original states um, in this kind of most significant, most kind of holy place for American democracy. Now, you, you're a specialist, particularly in Civil War statuary, right? Yes. So can you tell me something about what the debate is like among specialists in the statues field. We know what it's like among historians and, and that, again, very divisive debate. But in terms of specialists in statues, what, how, how, how has the debate been there? Sure. Um, so, you know, certainly the political debates that, that you see kind of across the broader spectrum are present um, among people who are specialists in, in, in statuary or in, in art history. Um, but in addition to those kind of debates, I think there's questions about preservation, um, about whether or not statues need to stay in the place where they were meant to go um, in order to retain, like whether or not the, the space is part of the work. Um, and whether or not the work is destroyed of being taken out of that space, and then whether that, whether that even matters. Um, and then also what to do with sculptures once they've been taken out of those spaces. What is appropriate to do with a 25 foot high equestrian statue if it's not gonna be up on a pedestal in your town square? Um, and so I think a lot of folks have been falling a lot all along the, the spectrum thinking about those kind of questions, thinking about who has the right to decide what should stay and what should go, um, who has the right to decide what should be preserved, um, and what should go back in its place, I think are some of the big things that, that uh, our historians are worried about. Do you think this is now a time, especially after the events of last week, especially how close to the lawmakers that riotous mob got, that this is a time to really reflect on the remaining Confederate statues in that building and do something about them? I really hope so. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there has been attempts kind of from the top down a number of times um, to, to get them all out of there. I keep hoping that there's going to be a possibility. I mean, uh, the Democrats now will have both the House and the Senate. So it's possible that a um, kind of bipartisan bill could go through to get the rest of them out. If that doesn't happen, um, the ones for the remaining states are all pretty conservative states. 
Um, so they would have to individually decide with their own legislatures to remove them. And I think that's probably pretty unlikely. Um, but I do really hope to see the rest of them out. Um, you know, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, should not be in our Capitol building. Um, in, in terms of the sort of formal properties of these sculptures, should all of them be taken to museums? Is that your is that your view? Should they be presented in museums alongside educational materials about the Confederacy, about white supremacy? I think that that sort of depends um, on a number of different things. Uh, when you're talking about all of the statues that are outside, I think there's something like around 700 or so actual statues related to Confederates um, that are all over the country. And if you think about the America's museums, which are already, you know, underfunded, um, you know, overloaded, if you talk to anybody who, who manages a collection about what kind of space they've got in storage, um, that the idea that 700 enormous statues are going to be absorbed by America's museums is, is pretty unlikely. Um, and of course, you know, it's not just the storage, it's the, you know, having someone who can really interpret them, find a way to integrate them into the collection, find a way to present them that is responsible. Um, and so, you know, that's certainly a big concern. And then, and then they're enormous. I mean, what do you do with it? How do you put a 25 foot statue inside? <laughs> you know, what are they going to do with Robert E. Lee? That, that statue is huge. They're not going to be able to get that thing off the pedestal in one piece, probably. Um, and so, you know, sometimes that's not practical. Um, there certainly there have some, been some museums that have done beautiful jobs um, with taking statues and uh, um, representing them. For instance, the Valentine Museum in Richmond um, is probably going to end up getting that Jefferson Davis statue that was toppled from Monument Avenue. And I think they're planning on, on presenting it on its side, covered in graffiti. Um, and interpreting it that way, which is a really interesting way to be thinking about it. Um, cemeteries I've talked about as possible places for some of these um, as, you know, potentially appropriate kind of more semi-private places. Um, but, you know, I think there's going to have to be a lot of different solutions um, for, for, for things to do with them. Um, one of the striking aspects of this is, of course, that Robert E. Lee has come down, but the movement of these rioters was going in the other direction. What are your thoughts on that? I think, you know, we're at a really critical inflection point for America. Um, one that in some ways I feel really heartened by um, and I feel really encouraged by a lot of things that are happening. But in, some, in other ways, I'm pretty terrified um, about what could potentially happen. You know, as, as a historian of the Civil War, I am constantly reading the, the tea leaves and seeing the signs around me and, and worrying about what could potentially happen. Um, what happened last week in the Capitol was terrifying from that regard. But I think, you know, what we're seeing is sort of um, the ways in which there are kind of two Americas right now. One that is finally starting to think about, you know, the real dark parts of America's past um, between the history of slavery, um, the history of genocide um, against N Native Americans, um, you know, the, the history of settler colonialism, all of these, these things that, that we have done as a people, Americans, um, and are finally trying to look and reckon with the spaces around us, the myths that the art that we've put up tells, um, and, you know, trying to think like, what do we actually want to do? How do we want to represent ourselves in these spaces? And how, how can we you kind of move forward if we're really thinking about these things? So in some ways, I've been really heartened by, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, by, you know, the conversations surrounding the iconoclasm of Confederate statues. Um, you know, so many of these things seem to me to be moving in the right direction towards finding a place where maybe we can finally heal from some of these things. But what's happening at the same time is that there's a huge population in America that um, is very resistant to this kind of change, that does not want to undo any of this myth mythology, does not see a path forward to a space where perhaps we can get through this and then heal together, and is very scared of what all of this means. And those people were the ones that were in the Capitol last week. Um, they're the ones who were standing behind President Trump and continuing to stand behind him and continuing to try to overthrow this, you know, completely democratic election. Um, and so, you know, seeing Robert E. Lee go, huge moment of hope for me. Um, I've been upset about that statue 
I've seen it in person a couple of times um, in the Capitol and have been extremely upset about it for a very long time. Um, I was so glad to see it go. Having this happen then a couple of weeks later tells me that we still have a long way to go. One of the key aspects of in this debate has been the reaction of lawmakers. And certainly in the UK, we have a culture secretary whose attitude towards statues is very conservative. I mean, he's a conservative politician, but his attitude is to leave them up and then to educate around them. Do you sense that there's a unity, um, particularly among democratic lawmakers, around this subject? Or are there still people to be persuaded on that side about the merits of removal as opposed to maintenance and education? I think that that's one of those things that is changing a lot um, and is going to keep shifting. Um, If you had asked me this question two years ago, I would have said that there was still a long way to go for even democratic populations. Heck, if you had asked me this question in May, I would have said that. Um, You know, I keep telling people that I was speaking to a group of graduate students on like May 26th and said, gosh, I'm gonna have a quiet summer. I can't imagine anyone's gonna tear any monuments down in the middle of a pandemic. Um, And it was like three days later (laughs) that that started happening. Um, So, you know, the window for what is possible Um, for, you know, who can be persuaded um, is moving very, very quickly. And I think that a lot of Democrats have really come around to realizing that some of these things really need to go. Um, And that really, the first thing we should be thinking about is the people that they're causing harm to. Um, I always think about the person who might have to go to a courthouse um, in a southern county seat Um, perhaps because they have been charged with something that they shouldn't have been charged with. And then to go into their court date, they have to walk past a Confederate monument. And those are the people we have to be thinking about first. Um, The people who are being harmed by, by these things continuing to be in our spaces. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You can read our reports of the January the 6th riots and the Capitol collection at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS, which you can get from the App Store. Coming up, we have Batman and Hannah Arendt. But first, here are some of the top stories on the Yard Newspaper's website this week. Claude Levesque, one of France's most celebrated artists, has been accused of sexual assault by a fellow artist and has suspended his representation by the Camille Manor Gallery. A gallery statement added that the decision was made in order to allow the judicial authority to carry out the necessary investigations. Levesque is under police investigation for rape and sexual assault of minors under the age of 15. In an in-depth report, the French newspaper Le Monde revealed that the investigation was launched a year and a half ago after a complaint was filed by the Swiss sculptor Laurent Follon over events that occurred since the late 1970s. Levesque denies the accusations. Art chippers say they're experiencing teething problems transporting works to European countries since the UK completed its separation from the European Union on the 1st of January. Logistics companies are reporting additional costs, administration and time in shipments, a lack of training in the new rules among customs officials and even crates containing artworks being broken open after changes to the rules for air freight. And finally, Thomas Heatherwick's spiralling climbable sculpture The Vessel in Manhattan's Hudson Yards closed to the public indefinitely this week after a 21-year-old man who jumped to his death became the third suicide in less than a year at the site. A spokesman for the developer, related companies, which commissioned the 150-foot sculpture as a centrepiece of the 25 billion Hudson Yards complex, said that the structure was temporarily closed while the company consulted with experts on how to prevent future suicides. You can read these stories and more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This January, Christie's presents the collection of Mr and Mrs John H. Goodfriend, 834 Fifth Avenue. View the superb decorative arts and furniture that grace this beautifully designed New York interior. Explore the unparalleled collection of English and French furniture, Russian works of art, silver, porcelain, old master paintings, Chinese ceramics, books and runway jewels from the House of Chanel. The two-day live auction in New York begins on the 26th of January, while the three online sales, thematically organised, begin on the 14th of January. 
engage with a unique and refined collection of John and Susan Gutfreund. Find out more on christies.com. Welcome back. Before we go on, do make sure you catch up with the latest episodes of our other podcast, A Brush With, in which I have in-depth conversation with artists about their influences and cultural experiences. The latest series features interviews with, among others, Ragnar Kjartensen and Rachel Whiteread, and the latest podcast is A Brush With, the South African artist Tracy Rose. Subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're currently listening. Now, a near mint condition copy of the first comic appearance of Batman was auctioned this week at Heritage Auctions in the US. It sold for $2.2 million with buyer's premium, becoming the second most expensive comic book sold at auction. Superman keeps the top spot. Ed Jaster, the senior vice president at Heritage Auctions and a comic book collector and dealer, spoke to Helen Stoilus, the art newspaper's editor in the Americas and an avid comics reader herself, about this exceptional item. Heritage is selling a near mint copy of Batman One, uh, originally published in 1940 on Thursday, in its comic art signature auction in Dallas. Um, and at the time of this recording on Wednesday, and I've been checking it a couple times, and it's been it's been increasing, you know, as as we're talking this morning. Presale bidding was already up to 1.57 million dollars, or 1.89 million with buyer's premium. That's kind of a record um, for for Batman comics, right? Yes, as far as public auction goes, this is a new record for a copy of any Batman comic book, including Detective 27, which is his first appearance. In November, we set our personal record and the record for any Batman comic book for a copy of Detective 27 that was graded at 7.0 at 1.5 million. So we're already nearly a half a million to $400,000 over our previous record. And we still have a day's left of bidding to go. And is this kind of record breaking sale something that you've been seeing more of? Has the market for comics been growing um, in recent years? Yes, certainly the last five years have been close to exponential, but I've been doing this for 30 years, both as a collector and as a, uh, a dealer, a, a professional. And good comic books have always risen very well over time. You know, good times, bad times. There's ebb and flow, but a copy of Batman 1 is always going to be, has always been worth more five years after purchase than it was at the time you purchased it. And why do you think that is? What 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 is it that makes um, comics like these really well-regarded characters appreciate so much? Well, I think as much as anything, it's a nostalgia factor. So we tend to embrace things that make us feel good about ourselves and bring back pleasant memories, happy memories of our childhood, typically. So even though there's not a lot of us out there that were born in 1930 and bought a copy of this off the newsstand, the character has been transcendental. A lot of these characters have been. And so Batman is still a super strong character today. The movies, the cartoons. I used to put it this way, you know, when my daughter was young, you know, people would kind of poo-poo the popularity of comic books. And there's always this thing of like, we're at the precipice, we're at the abyss, and this is all going to be over before you know it. I'm like, guys, I still see five-year-olds dressed as Spider-Man and Batman, okay? So these characters, you know, they keep living on and new generations discover them. And then... Some of us are fortunate enough to have the income to go back and trace the historic roots. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's the way it is in a lot of these collectible categories. You know, the memorabilia from baseball players from the 1880s can be extremely valuable. You know, it's been a hundred years since anybody's even, you know, I was going to say that's alive that would even be contemporary, but more like 150 years. And so it is with comic books. You know, people who love the the genre and the collecting, some of them have the appreciation and the wherewithal to go back and collect things from the beginning of the genre. And do you think the kind of, you mentioned, you know, movies and things, do you think this Hollywood, you know, um, this growth of Hollywood movies, pop culture, kind of this embracing of comic book characters and storylines has has um, been a factor in, in the growth of the market? Undoubtedly. I mean, unquestionably. It seems that maybe 
one in 10 major Hollywood movies that have come out in the last almost 10 years now have been you know, comic book related, have their origins in, in comic books. And you know, certainly the Avengers and, and you know, Captain America and the Incredible Hulk and Black Panther, you know, the litany there, you know, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman. In response to that, the value of these characters has gone up precipitously. I mean, it's, it's just mind blowing, really. And this comic in particular, can you talk about what makes it so valuable? Um, it's it's a near mint condition copy. Um, it's got a rating of 9.4, right? On the CGC, which is the Certified Guarantee Company's um, mm-hmm. ratings. Can you talk a little bit about what, what makes this kind of such a valuable copy and, and what this kind of ranking of comic books, how does that, how is that decided? When we value a comic book, there's certain things we look at. And this copy of Batman 1 is a 10 on all those metrics. So how important is the character? Well, Batman, if you have any inkling of knowledge of comic book and comic book history in American pop culture, Batman resonates. So he's a 10 there. It's the number one issue. It's not the first appearance of Batman and Robin, but it's the first issue to feature all their stories, exclusively Batman stories. Another thing is condition. Well, let me talk a little bit about um, CGC and and third-party grading. So um, it's the finest copy that's ever been graded. Quite possibly, it's the finest copy that exists. It has white pages, which is a good indicator of the state of preservation. So again, another 10. And it's it's never been restored, right? The, it, there's there's restoration of comics as well. Yeah, it has not been restored, and also um, the eye appeal, just the aesthetics, mm. you know, dynamic cover. It's yellow and red, you know, bold primary colors. You flip it over. There's a pinup of Batman and Robin. Now, a couple of the other side notes on this: it's not just the number one issue. It's also the first appearance of the Joker. And the Joker is arguably anywhere from the most important to somewhere like the fifth most important character in DC lore. It's also the first appearance of Catwoman. Known as the cat in in this. She doesn't have her her Catwoman costume yet. She's more of a very very glamorous uh, jewel thief, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And those are not old enough to remember the TV show. Mm-hmm. She was the femme fatale. She was the one who had Batman mesmerized. And oh, absolutely. Even in this that, comic book, he's he's completely head over heels for her. He lets her get away. Yeah. And then like the, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer movies. Mm-hmm. So again, importance, you know, first appearance of two giant, giant characters. Mm-hmm. This book is a 10 out of 10 on virtually every metric you could measure this by. How how often do these kinds of um, comic books come around? Is is this uh is this something that collectors kind of like wait years to see? Uh, you know how do collectors gauge this kind of opportunity? From one perspective, if people have been collecting comic books since 1940 or so, yeah, you had to wait 80 years for this to come around. Roughly 10 years ago, we stole the 9.2 copy for 567,000. Wow. So. When you get to these key books and they come up in condition better than about a 6.0, that's a special thing. And as they come up in an 8.0, that's just rare air. You know, that's something you might get one or two bites of the apple, you know, every couple, three years. In 9.0, you know, you get your chance about every five years. In 9.4, you know, kind of 80 years. (laughs) And what's the kind of like early entry into the comic book market? How do you kind of get started in in comic book collecting? Can you tell us what people should look for if they're interested? Well, it's still a very vibrant hobby. You buy what you like. You know, people still go to comic book shops. Um, They order comics. They order them online. Most of the stories that have ever been written are available in some form online or through compendiums that that archive a, a, a number of years and real typically people start collecting comic books when they're five six seven eight years old 
and it becomes a lifetime passion. Myself, I started when I was six. And, you know, by the time I got to high school, I mean, I had other options <laughs> to spend out my money. You know, you discover, you discover a bigger world. And I put down my collecting for a number of years and um, sold my collection to pay for my wedding. Wow. When the time came. And then about uh, 1990, I picked it up again. So, yeah, it's not unusual. Our, our chairman, Jim Halpern, when he was a kid, he published his own fanzine, you know, and he put it out on mimeograph and he did the drawings and every, every now and then he'll find one on, on wow. eBay. You know? and Jim was born in 52. So he was probably doing this about 1961, 62, 63. So the point I'm trying to make is it's a lifelong love addiction almost. And people never forget that. And this this particular comic book has that kind of um, really personal collecting history. Um, I was reading about it, it came from Billy T. Giles, right? The um, the collector and dealer who bought it from Camelot Bookstore in Houston in 1982. And um, so it sounds like he started getting interested in comics. He decided to start collecting when he was helping his son build a Spider-Man collection of comic books, right? Correct. It was a father and son team, and you know the consigner is his son. The story goes that they advertised this book circa 1980, 82, in a trade publication, what we call a fancy, mm -hmm. where they run ads by collectors and dealers to buy and sell old comic books. And they had this book listed for five thousand dollars, and it kind of sit there and languished for for a number of months at least. Wow! Until they went into the store personally and offered three thousand dollars for it and it was accepted and you know it's been in the family since 1982 and how do you think um comic book collecting kind of compares to art collecting what are the similarities are there any differences well i you know i've also started the american painting department and i'm also an expert and specialist in american illustration and especially illustration is a very very strong category for heritage and um, there's a lot more corollaries than people in the art world would like to, uh, to seed, if you will. Um, I mean, we're all collectors, you know, and one of the things that makes this comic so great, this Batman number one, is it's exceptional. And there's jumping off points. And today, about twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 is the jumping off point for a Batman number one. But that's about, you know, that's terrible. It's missing the back cover. It has tape. It's soiled. It's, you know, then you get into like the $100,000 class, which is a complete copy. And again, probably nothing to write home about. When you get into the 6.0 kind of grade, well, now you're talking a quarter million. Wow. And then in the 8.0 grade, you're talking a half a million. So I think of Norman Rockwell, who's an artist I, you know, I, I work with a lot. And if you have a sketch, well, it's valuable. You know, it's worth $5,000. If you have a great sketch, on and on. But at the tip of the iceberg, you know, the, the, is the Saturday Evening Post mm -hmm. covers. You know, and there, a printed Saturday Evening Post cover, pretty much a million to two millions, the jumping off point. And as we can see, they could easily be 100 million. Yeah. I mean, this Batman comic, it's the most expensive Batman book that has come to auction, um, but it's not the most expensive comic overall, right? Um, that record uh, was set in 2014 for the 1938 Action Comics number one, which was the first appearance of Superman, um, which uh, sold for $3.2 million. Is that right? I'm not sure if the figure's 3.2 or 3.1, but... Yes. And there was another Action Comics number one that sold um, a few years earlier yes. um, that had been previously owned by Nick Cage, um, a well-known uh, comic fan who's named his son after um, Superman, right? Um, bet, which made um, $2.16 million. Um, so you're kind of inching up there towards the high-end category. Do you think you could potentially set a world record with this, you Batman? Know, from your lips. Um, I think we have a real, <laughs> I think we have a real good chance of eclipsing the, the 2 million mark. And 
I think that's almost a foregone conclusion at this point. You know, Action One is that. It, it's the king of the hill. It's the first comic of any consequence to be devoted to a superhero type character that was created expressly for comic book. And it predates the, you know, certainly the Batman one by a couple of years in terms of rarity, you know, just even finding a copy, you know, uh, an action one in a basic collector grade of like a 4.0 on a 10 scale, well over half a million, probably approaching 800,000 in today's market. So where do you think this comic book might end up? Is Are comics collected by museums? Is it mostly private collectors? Do you think it could end up in, in a public collection? Or do you think it's this is really for a, a really, you know, deep-pocketed comic book collector? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, um, institutions do not acquire comic books other than by, you know, donation. Yeah, I've never seen a, a, an institution aggressively bid on comic books. Uh, so it will go to an individual. And as far as where it's going to end up, I, you know, ask me tomorrow. <laughs> well, great. Thank you so much, Ed, and good luck with the sale. Um, can't wait to see if you uh, knock out Superman with your Batman. Yeah, well, wish us luck. Wish us luck. And finally this week, the London gallerist Richard Saltoon has announced that he's devoting the entirety of 2021 to a programme with eight theme shows about the political theorist Hannah Arendt. The text at the heart of the series is Arendt's anthology of essays between past and future, completed in 1968. And Saltoon's programme on Hannah Arendt, Eight Proposals for Exhibition, picks up on the eight chapters of Arendt's book. The exhibitions will feature more than 20 international artists, and I spoke to two of them, Peter Kennard and Vivian Corland, about Arendt and how their work relates to her theories. Before we go into the exhibitions and look at what Richard's doing over the course of this year, I wanted to just ask you individually what Arendt has meant in terms of your work, whether there is a direct relation to your thoughts and, and, and images. Peter, could we begin with you? How, how have you interpreted her thoughts and have they directly affected your own thinking? Yeah, well, I think um, her work and her um, example, because she, she had to leave, she had to flee Germany um, in 1933. And um, she said at the time that, that, that it was no longer possible to be indifferent or to be passive you know and i think that's that's the core of her work to me is that it's always about political reality i mean she she didn't call herself a, a philosopher but she called herself a political theorist and i think that's what's so powerful about her that she's always looking at the world as she said she looks at the world as it is rather than as the world as she wants it to be so her work is is not um, systematic in the sense of, you know, like you could say, her work isn't systematic. It's always being, it's always about, to me, it's always about encountering the world. And um, and I've, that's what I've tried to do with, you know, in my way, with, with with my work is sort of encounter what's going on in the world and, and not base it on a, a sort of utopian idea of what I want or telling people what to do, which she doesn't do either. Um, it, it's about actually finding ways to confront the world. And she, she always talked about thinking as the most important thing, in a way, um, confront the world by thinking and thinking out of the box. She talked about, I think there was a phrase, um, what was it? It was thinking without a banister, which I really like. <laughs> you know, and you do feel that with her work. She's always, she's taking risks and she's taking on ideas. Some of the things she she wrote about, I think, she made mistakes in terms of political mistakes, but they're all about her wanting to get to truth. And at the back of her mind is all the time is the horror of fascism and totalitarianism. And it's that uh, quality of non-thinking of people believing in lies that um, she was fighting all the time in her work, I think. And of course, this week and last week, we've been confronted by the, the ultimate sort of an example of it with Trump, and we've been confronted with it for four years, and which is why her work is so powerful now. One of the reasons it is her analysis of totalitarianism and her analysis that it's not just 
group of evil people getting together. It's actually much more politically formed than that through lies becoming truth. And it's, it's, it's that way that she, in her work, she fights that all the time. Yeah. Vivian, what about you? Well, um, I think uh, I, I might try to put uh, what Hannah Arendt has been in my life in, in, in a slightly more personal way. When I was really very young, I think that a mind like uh, Hannah Arendt and a sensibility uh, like uh, Hannah Arendt entered my life uh, perhaps through, uh, through my parents in the sense that uh, my mother... Uh, had been smuggled out of the Warsaw Ghetto as a, as a child of seven. That was obviously uh, one of the most formative narratives. And, uh, and then the fact that my dad, who was older than my mother, my mother was born in 1936 uh, in, in Poland, but my, my dad uh, was about 10 years older and um, was just about one year uh, too young to be conscripted into World War II. Uh, from South Africa. She was um, so much a, uh, uh, what the Jews call a Yeka, a German Jew, as opposed to a Polish Jew, uh, or, you know, whatever that means, or an Eastern European Jew. She, she came with this whole uh, tradition. Because she was who she was, and because I was who I was, there was this huge point of identification for me. For some reason, the fascination with, uh, well, with German culture was not for some reason, was obviously had a lot to do with the fact of what happened and having been uh, born because, because it happened, and not only me, but everybody probably. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, growing up in apartheid South Africa and Hannah Arendt being the epitome of, you know, someone who, who actually called thinking a dangerous activity you know and um, and 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 for her thinking was a as as we've all said before a deeply uh, critical uh, exercise there was no thinking without uh, critical thinking and so um, she was uh, she was uh, dynamic and also very very funny that's the thing she she had um, a really wicked uh, typically Berliner sense of humour, even though she wasn't born and bred in Berlin, but she she was in many ways such a Berliner in terms of her sensibility. I really, really identified with this to such a point that actually when I left South Africa just immediately after graduating uh, at the University of Cape Town, I headed, uh, you know, via a few stops in Freiburg and everything where Heidegger had been to uh, to uh, to to what was West Berlin then. So... So uh, there's, I, I feel very personally connected to her. What formed me so incredibly, incredibly uh, powerfully in terms of ideas uh, was of the, 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 all those guys were, were, none of them were women. Only, only Arendt was, was a woman, you know. Let's talk about these exhibitions then, because Vivian, you're showing in the first exhibition, which is based on the first chapter of Arendt's book, Between Past and Future, which is called The Modern Age. And then, Peter, you're showing, a so you're having a solo exhibition, which is themed around the concept of history, which is the second essay in the book. Could you give me an example of work that you're showing in the exhibition and how abstractly or directly it relates to Arendt's themes? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I believe that uh, all three pieces that are in that uh, first show relate so strongly, but perhaps not uh, not in a directly narrative way. In any case, I don't work in it. My paintings are not directly narrative anyway. And I mean, one of the subjects, uh, the meta subjects of my work is in fact a narrative to what extent painting can actually convey a narrative, etc. But they're connected in the sense that uh, that Hannah Arendt herself felt that these, uh, uh, at the end of it, uh, uh, lastly, eight essays that form this this uh, book um, uh, uh, between past and future are are also not obviously related. I mean, you could argue, in fact, that they're not. So their their connection is uh, uh, the author herself and her her thinking. I have one pair of paintings that were completed in uh, 2017. And that ha haven't uh, been seen before. And one older painting from 1991 uh, from a, a, a series that I started in 1990. In terms of the 2017 uh, pair of paintings that were so absolutely perfect for this project, I, I, I 
decided is because one has that famous quote by uh, Immanuel Kant. Uh, it's only a partial quote uh, of um, uh, referring to the uh, to to what fills him with uh, awe for his whole life and engages him spiritually and uh, intellectually for his whole life. The contemplation of the starry sky above above me and the moral law within me uh, on the one hand. So th that painting is called Poland is on Pluto. I'll come back to that uh, in a sense. It's, it certainly doesn't explain the painting. Uh, and the, the, the second of the pair is actually called uh, Jan van Riebeek's map because in fact there is a an old uh, 18th century uh, map of, of Cape Town and the colonization by the Dutch East India Company when they landed there in the mid 17th century. Uh, it, so it's called uh, Jan van Riebeek's map, Königsberg. And um, both paintings actually began their physical life as paintings of the old uh, Prussian or Weimar era flag with the uh, black, red, and gold. I was just absolutely uh, fascinated by the, the uh, crazy conundrum of a situation. I had always thought that the pinnacle of uh, Western culture, which, by the way, I had been plodding through in my work from the 80s until, I got, you know, until it dawned on me in the late 80s that this is a tradition that also would have excluded me as a woman and as a Jew, um, uh, uh, that the that the pinnacle of this Western culture that we are confronted with when we study art history and are you know steeped in it as I am um, is uh, um, is uh, German Enlightenment culture and the seat of this great culture with the, all the philosophers that we know and love and Arendt herself her her critical you know the tradition that she comes from uh, was a, a place that effectively doesn't exist anymore. So this was, you know, the, which was Königsberg, now uh, or then later Kaliningrad after World War II. This was the seat of culture and the German language, where now uh, German is not spoken and it, it doesn't exist. It simply evaporated. It went to fucking Pluto. It was literally bombed to hell. And Peter, your response to the concept of history or the work that you're showing in in that second exhibition? Yeah, I'm I'm showing three bodies of work that began 50 years ago, so I'd say. So I've been at it a long time. And the first body I'd started when I, I, I started in 1968, in fact, and I was at the Slade at the time. And while I was there, I felt a sort of spirit of rebellion against the, there was an orthodoxy there at that time, mainly with sort of colour field painting, that thing that was going on, post-painterly post abstraction, whatever you want to call it. And then, I went on a lot of demonstrations against the Vietnam War, and that was my political awakening, you know, which is um, very safe compared with the political awakening of Hannah Arendt, you know, which, which was actually fleeing, um, as Vivian talked about. But th that was mine. I wanted, so I wanted to find a way to make work that was in some way responding to what I was begun to find out about. I'd been a sort of quite straight painter before that. And so um, I started using photography and then uh, working on it, working with photography, because photography at that time, I mean, maybe more than now, was, was seen as a fact, where, you know, it was a trace of reality. So um, I started using photography plus paint and other materials and made these series of paintings, which I called Stop Paintings. And that's, um, there were two rooms in the exhibition uh, of those and they're they're all made from overlays of photographs and then printed and then there's a lot of marks and and I'd started reading you know another great uh, person from that period uh, Brecht and Benjamin and and of course Brecht talked about alienation effects in his plays and I I used a lot of marks um not not marks with an X, but marks with a K, on, on over the images to try and show that when you're looking at the work, you're not looking at a reality, you're looking at a construction. You know, it was that sort of alienation effect that Breck talked about. So I'm showing those works, and, and they're all they're all about they're about the invasion of Czechoslovakia, which happened at that time. They're about you know May '68. They're about what we were doing in art schools, in fact, in. Uh, 68 we were you know there was a sit-ins at Hornsey and so I was 
part of that sort of thing. So all, all, all that went into those works and, and the civil rights movement in, in the States plus Vietnam. So I, I overlaid all these images together. It, it was a matter of showing, and I think that, that sort of ties in with Hannah Arendt, who I did actually start reading around that time. You know, the way she, she was actually talking about how we, we've actually got to think into, with facts. Now, Vivian, before we actually started recording, you said something about Hannah Arendt turning in her grave about the events of the last week. You want to say something about that, don't you? To, to bring not on the periphery, but front and centre uh, the events of uh, the, you know, in the last seven days that the whole world was watching this uh, outrageous uh, breach of uh, the nation, meaning the US capital, obviously, uh, and, uh, and the fact that even more shocking than that was the fact that, uh, that uh, uh, bodies who were not white uh, would never have gotten even close. That was even more outrageous. From, from the beginning, when we watched this in real time, when we could not actually believe what was happening, and, uh, and also uh, to call it what it is, which is simply white supremacy. That's it. It's nothing else. It's not Trump supporters. It's not this. It's not that. It's white supremacy. And, and the fact that um, we are here because, uh, because of a uh, political philosopher or a philosopher initially uh, called Hannah Arendt, uh, the, just knowing that, um, that she wrote an important book called The Origins of Totalitarianism is enough to link all of this, which is why I said at the beginning that Hannah Arendt this week, these last days must absolutely be spinning in her grave. So even if we haven't read The Origins of Totalitarianism, it's enough to know that she wrote this almost with that title. Peter, you're a professor of political art. And I wonder to what extent is Arendt taught in your teaching? You know, how do you do you do you address Arendt frequently with your students? Well, well, I think one of the main things about teaching is bringing in knowledge that people, you know, like the main media is so full of crap that they're not going to find out anything about Hannah Arendt from mass media. Um, and so I've always thought one of the most important things is to bring in writers, you know, bring in the, the ideas from writers, bring in, make people aware of their work. You know, when, when I started, any sort of political art, especially political art done, done by women, was, was seen as, as, a, as a back alley of art, you know, like someone like Hannah Hock. I mean, I discovered her after I was at the Slade, and she, she, she was seen as someone way out at the edge. You know, the canon was still the canon. So I, I've always brought these people in, and now, of course, the canon is exploding, which is brilliant. I mean, in terms of women artists, black artists, artists from Asian artists, artists from all over the world. It's, it's breaking down that, that autonomy it had. I'm trying to bring stuff in now from the past as well, which can get left behind. I mean, I know Hannah Aaron said that in terms of education, she was a conservative and a revolutionary, small c conservative. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I feel I'm a bit like that in the sense that I really believe in history, in, the, in art history, in, in, th- in, in the fact that one isn't an individual. And, and, and that's another thing that her work has inspired me, that she's always says she's not talking about the I, she's talking about the we. And I think it's one of the most saddest things that's happened in teaching of art, that it's, it's always aimed at indiv- the individual. They're, you know, they're marked now. You have to mark their imagination out of 100 and things like that. Crazy things. You know, like, and, and they don't see themselves often now as part of a, a whole... A whole world of art, which I think is really important, you know, and it's, it's something that Hannah Arendt was very involved with. She, she said that education was about renewing the world, I think, you know, which I think is right. You're, you're, re- you're re- renewing people's identity w- um, within the world. Vivian, do you, some final thoughts from you on, on, on responding to, to Arendt now. Well, she does, she does speak about action, uh, politics, revolution. But um, even though it, it, she's not disingenuous when she doesn't call herself a philosopher, you still have to think of, um, of, uh, uh, of students in 1968 banging down the door there of Theodore Adorno's 
officers at the university saying, you know, you know everything, you're brilliant, tell us what to do now, you know, we are in crisis here, we want you know everything, you, we want you to tell us what to do and how to act, and, and his utter refusal and withdrawal. And I think that, um, again, uh, uh, what, what, what we have from her always is the imperative to engage in hard critical thinking, which was, I, I think, uh, um, you know, there, there, there is no, uh, there's no engagement with the world or with uh, events or actions and anything that she referred to w w without that. And that's all we have. And of course, we have that only through the medium of language. Her spirit uh, yes, uh, I could see how she would call herself or could be called a conservative in lots of ways. But she was, because of her obvious indep independent thinking, she was deeply irreverent, much more so than she appears, because this is not what she would call and what the German philosophical uh, 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 tradition would call common sense thinking, uh, being critical, being deeply irreverent and not accepting categories and and uh, 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 policies and things as they are in, in government and things like that. So her legacy is this uh, political thinking, this, this, this thinking, and her absolute brilliance and intelligence. Okay, well, thank you both very much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Of course, galleries in London are closed at the moment, but you can see the online resources for the On Hannah Arendt programme at richardsaltoon.com. And that's it for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com, click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page, and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so. And please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. You can also find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Judy Michalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks to Sarah, to Helen and Ed and to Peter and Vivian. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.